Hello. Good morning and welcome to this Dawn Busters Taste Challenge. Okay, we're closing out this particular series of American blended whiskey. There's a lot of wind from the tropical storm. Not a hurricane yet, if ever. Barry Gibb. Tropical storm Barry Gibb. Um, let's see, you might hear the wind. Let me see. Actually, it's kind of quiet right now. It's not even, no rain and a breeze. Well, that's pretty anticlimactic. So we'll see what happens with Tropical Storm Barry Gibb. Now, let me start. We have from 1934. Seagram Seven Crown American Blended Whiskey, a blend of distinctive character. It wears seven crowns. You say, what the heck is seven crowns? <clears throat> I have a theory about that. <laughs> um, the new label has this huge seven on it, but I don't know. They might have gone back to the pre. I don't know. I can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. Anyway, <clears throat> this is kind of like the foil underneath the plastic filigree. And it's kind of a very fine grain sandpaper, sandpaper finish. Nice bottle. Costs you about $13 a bottle, I do believe. That's the average for the United States of America, Incorporated. <laughs> the United States of America. Okay. Uh, and there's a uh, embossed seven crown on the back. You can feel that. This is a Diageo brand as of the year 2000. It was Seagram's all along, but Seagram's went bankrupt and collapsed because they had more payout than revenue. <laughs> and that's always a bad problem if it goes on for years. And then it gets even worse when you cannot make your payments, <laughs> your debt payments. When you can't service the debt, you know what's going to happen. Okay. S7. I think the seven crowns you see in 1926, was it? Joseph Seagram died. His family didn't want the company. The Bronfen family, Jewish, Russian immigrant family bought it. And so I think you started seeing some uh, Kabbalah type things, those sort of like oblique messages that certain people will send out to, to send signals to each other. You know what I'm saying? Like smoke signals that the average guy on the street wouldn't detect a shibboleth in other words. And so is the seven crown some numero Logical significance like a menorah seven lampstands uh more than likely you say but their magic must have been ineffective by the year 2000 mm-hmm yes um tc triple crown you say oh a horse racing whiskey yeah uh-huh i don't know about that Triple Crown from McCormick. Oh, I forgot to do the research on the use of oak extract in whiskey. Maybe today. Maybe today. Blue label. They've changed. They've updated the label. Okay, I got this for three ninety nine, three dollars ninety nine cents, three hundred seventy five milliliter bottle at Savant. No discount depot. Discount depot. U.S. Highway ninety business route in Marrero, Louisiana, Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. Okay. Uh, I think I'll be able to tell them apart because the Triple Crown is a strange little flavor. It's an unusual flavor, and I think that goes back to the use of the oak extract. Now, can any blended American whiskey use flavoring? Yes, they sure can. And in fact, I think almost all of them do. They use blending sherry you say sherry isn't that some kind of dessert wine yes 
from Spain. Well, yeah, but in America, it's from America. You know, in the European Union, it can only come from Shiraz, you know, that, and I mean, Sherry, Sherry, yeah, that part of Spain. But we're not under the law of the European Union, so uh, American companies can sell champagne. You know? All right. That's pretty dark. Now, you know, Seagram 7 Crown is pretty dark. Is it colored dark with caramel color? I don't know. It's from Indiana. It's always been from Indiana. That was the Seagram's huge distillery, which was started in 1847. And um, now it's under Midwest Grain Products who bought it. See, when Seagram's imploded eight, 19 years ago, different people come along and they start buying up all their assets, probably on probably for pennies on the dollar, you know, fire sale. So compact, uh, let's see, uh, Diageo got a hold of a bunch of stuff. Mid Midwest Grain Products got a hold of a bunch of stuff. Coca-Cola got the Seagram's uh, ginger ale. Um, um, Pernod Ricard got the uh, Seagram's uh, 100 Pipers and the Seagram's gins, which they were really keen to get. So, um, these things, but the, the brand doesn't die. You see the brand, like Libby's, Libby's, Manischewitz. They're not gonna kill a brand. No, <laughs> that's marketable. People want that, you see. So, Seagram 7, yeah, it's darker. This is gold, Amber, and this is, more of the tan amber you see. Um, you could you could sit sit here and just think of so many brands that have been bought by people, started by families, and now they own by multinational corporations, something like that. Howard Johnson's hotel chain, motels. They don't use the term motel anymore, but that is a good name because it's a motor hotel, meaning you can park your car in front of the room you don't have to haul a bunch of bags up the stairs down the hall you just get it out the trunk if you back up into the parking space put it into the room uh, motor hotel motel but now they all say uh just hotel because of the connotations but anyway howard johnson started Howard Johnson's as an ice cream parlor. In fact, I remember back in the early 1970s when they still had the ice cream parlor at the Howard Johnson's Hotel next to Interstate 10 in Jefferson Parish. Then that faded away and then the Howard Johnson's restaurants faded away. There might be one left. Uh, and then their hotel chain got bought out. Why? Why is that? Howard Johnson died. His son took over. You know, you say, oh no, same old story. Yeah, the child not is energetic or competent as the parent and running the company into the ground. And then at 10 years after he bought it, they sold out. So it's still around. The brand is there. People know Howard Johnson's, the brand is, I've stayed at the Howard Johnson's in New York City so many times, right there all for Interstate 95 in the Bronx, right next to the elevated train uh, thing. All right, in West Farms, okay. Uh, so the brands don't die, generally. The brands don't die. Gilbert Van Camp started Van Camp's pork and beans, like literally invented pork and beans. Got the idea to put white beans, you know, navy beans, in tomato sauce. Gilbert Van Camp. Then his son, can't remember his son's name, kind of perfected it. And uh, no, they don't own it anymore. You say, what about Triple Crown? Who's gonna buy that? Well, you know, Triple Crown is not a popular brand. Now, if it's not a popular brand, yeah, it'll die. You know, it's it's a marginal item, you know. You might see Triple Crown in your area. More than likely, you will not. It's it's not sold in this parish. We don't have counties in Louisiana, we have parishes. Um, but Seagram Seven Crown is one of those big time brands. I don't have your brain for big deals. Um, any place that sells liquor is going to have triple crown. I mean, <laughs> Seagram seven crown, you know what I mean? Any bar in America, any bar room, 
any store that sells alcohol or whiskey is going to have Seagram Southern Crown. That, you know, it's not like you're going to go somewhere. They're not going to have Jack Daniels. They're not going to have Seagram Southern Crown. They're not going to have Bacardi rum. That's a given. That will happen. Smirnoff rum, uh, Smirnoff vodka. That's going to happen. Uh, Crown Royal. Or as everybody says, Crown. I'm going to drink some Crown and Coke. So these things are going to, now you get these marginal brands, maybe not. And then they might fade away. But it's, but, uh, all right, enough lecture on brand feasibility and brand permanence. You feel me? You don't hear me. Let me talk over. Tell you. All right. Put the live chat up just in case. Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go walking in about 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'll walk half a mile. That's the plan. Later on this morning, I'll walk another half a mile. Later on today, I'll walk another half a mile. A mile and a half on Saturday. You say, wow, that's not a lot. Well, it is when you do it every day, every day, every day. I don't miss. I don't miss. I don't miss. And I stay in shape. I think I stay in shape. You know, I weighed myself this morning. I need to gain a little weight. I weighed 143.2. I, I said, mm, too thin. But the blood pressure was looking good last time I checked in May, right? I think 108 over 67. Nice, nice. Body mass index. Nice. Alcohol intake. Moderate. Steady but moderate. Now people see my videos and that's all they see. So they think he drinks all day because that's your only reference point. I'm not, you know, you don't see a video of me making the bed or, or walking half a mile or picking up branches in the backyard or cutting the grass. You know, it's like you only get a little glimpse. Now you might say you, the viewer might say your, your life is boring. I bet it's a boring life. It is, but I like mundane things. So see, if you are attracted to mundane, like sitting on a couch and look through, looking for an hour through a book of flags, flags of the world, you say, well, I will, I will lose my mind behind that. Yes, so my excitement level facility is low. You see what I mean? You, you, you'd be correct. You might say, I bet you love a football game that ends 10 to six. Yes, defensive struggle. So this is people like mundane things. Some people, some people like uh, you know these are personality traits. You don't change a personality trait. A leopard does not change his spots. Uh, Heinz Isink study personality traits. Very, very, very important. A uh, scientist, a uh, psychologist, uh, to study personality traits. But now they don't talk about him anymore. He's kind of like put on the. Uh, don't pay any mind to this man list because of his um, career. He was a government employee, you say, well, so? Yeah, but the government was Germany in the 1930s and 40s. But um, he said, well, I mean, that's where I lived. I had a job, you know, so I worked there. This smells woody and a little unusual. Bucky Dent said, what's up? Just chilling, drinking the bud. It's a uh, woody, it's a little charcoal. Now remember, or let's take into account, the Triple Crown is the 80-20 blend, 80% grain neutral spirits, and the Seagram's is 75-25, 75% grain neutral spirit. So you have a higher percentage of straight whiskey in the Seagram Seven Crown, 25% straight whiskey. Is it bourbon whiskey? Oh, probably. What bourbons are made at Indiana? Well, a lot. <laughs> a lot of bulk bourbon that they sell off to other companies so they can make craft whiskey. Um, so it could be any of those things. Could be Bouillet. You say Bouillet, Bouillet. I never heard of Bouillet bourbon. You've heard of Bullet, 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 Bouillet. Bouillet. I think it's probably pronounced Bouillet, but uh, Bouillet, Bouillet. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Back up the truck. Huh. 
this must be the triple crown because of its ex somewhat exotic and unusual aroma. It does smell like whiskey on first sniff. You'd say, oh, well, it's just ordinary old whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But sometimes with these, if you dig a little deeper, you get things that you weren't expecting and that you don't necessarily want. And I was a little shook, shaken, stirred. Because I did a um, Triple Crown versus 75 South Thursday. And um, boy, that got, got me in a conundrum. Because I think the Triple Crown finally started to evidence on inappropriate characteristics, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to have to taste it. I'm not quite sure, but I think I'm on the right road. And that strange oakiness. It's kind of like that Virginia black, and I bet you they're using that same thing, that dang oak extract. See, I'm on to you now. You got the wrong detective on your case now. You say, well, we we just mentioned it on the bottom of the website, very nonchalantly in an indis in an discreet manner. We wouldn't look expecting anybody to notice that. Yeah, but you got the right ta ta, but the wrong ho ho. I'm going to taste it. I'm going to taste it. I'm going to make the meat. I'm going to make all the meat. It's basic. I mean, it's basic. We, we're not going to make this out to be bigger than it is. You know, this does not have to be the big get even. This doesn't have to be anything at all. This is just basic serviceable come up, uh, blending whiskey. If you thought Seagram Seven Crown was some top of the line product, you thought wrong, but then no one thinks that. All right. No one would have any, any level of education about liquor products, I would think. <laughs> you see, the Triple Crown starts being a little bit of a county fair type thing. You know, a flim flam product. It's sort of like you need a carnival barker for it. It tries to present itself as something really tremendous. You know, you get on the website, we use fine grain bourbon. It's the most expensive bourbon in the world. It's like, uh-huh, sure. It's the most expensive bourbon in the world, but yet the bottle's only $21. Bizarre. Um, and they have a square-shaped bottle, like a gourmet bottle and all. But then, I don't know, you start tasting it and thinking on it. Like I was listening to the Stevie Nicks song last night, the um, Blue Lamp. So it was the only light on in the house. But she said, don't listen to her, listen through her. So then when you, you don't just drink the liquor, you think it. So if you take a metaphysical approach, then you start to pick up things that you wouldn't normally pick up just in a tasting, you see. So you don't listen to her, you listen through her. You know what I'm saying? So you drink through the liquor. You have a metaphysical approach. And then you start to pick up things that maybe aren't right. You say the numbers don't match. Right. It ain't really a GT. Somebody played a game. And you'll get caught out. You go to a car show and try to play games. They're going to catch you. You're going to feel foolish. You might catch a... Uh, uh, a walk up, you know, somebody that doesn't, they might think they know, but they don't really know. They say, I got the Camaro white book. Have you really read it? I flipped through it. Yeah. That's why you got caught out. And this is like the triple crown. See now seven crown 
you could you could respect them because they'll tell you right on the, they'll just tell you to your face right on the website well it's really made just for blending now, i like that approach this is what diageo is saying to you they're saying uh don't get too excited about this it's just a regular old blending whiskey it's nice it's well made but that's what it is they make no great claims to flavor let's say it got a little vanilla got a little wood got a little this and that but uh you know it's basic you want something really good come on step up with some cash and we'll take you down the road to our other whiskeys and our single malt scotch and now uh, <laughs> but you're gonna need a little bit more than twelve dollars you know so i like diageo's approach they just call it as they're selling it they don't try to trumpet it like it's some great item when it ain't They say the same thing for the VO, Seagram's VO, which has been sold to Sazerac, but it's still posted on their website. They just say, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what the company's saying. They're selling this product. They're selling a product to you, and they're saying, uh, that's okay. You might want to try something better, but you could buy it if you want. It's, you can get a good deal. I'm still waiting on my $8 refund from uh, Diageo, but I might add. I might check my calendar and see when I sent that. It said six to eight weeks. Starting to seem a little long in the tooth. I want my money. I want my money. I want my money. Otherwise, we just could be flipping baseball cards, kids. All right. Go tell Jimmy Cobb. Go tell Jimmy Conway you want your money, Maury. Oh, Henry. Henry boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. Do they have Danish? All right, um, this has got to be the Seagram Seven Crown. I'm gonna call it. Here we go, right here, live on the morning. In July of the Taste Challenge, here we go. Seven crown. Is it better? Well, yeah, because it's not a flim flam, you know. Seagram seven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. S7. I put that on it. S7. You had me going for a little while, TC, triple crown. You had me thinking it was really a quality product. But I figured there was something up with this. I said, it's too good to be true. And you know what? If something's too good to be true, it is. I have a friend. You probably know who I'm talking about. Not an actual friend that I hang out with, but a friend over the internet. And you got to take that with a grain of salt. But a friend, he's always falling for these internet pals, like these women that are uh, overly friendly. I was like, why would you believe this? Oh, well, she's an educated woman from uh, Empanina, and she's going to befriend me. And oh, this is an educated African woman from Ghana. And I said, well, that's wonderful. But then they always say, I don't usually do this, but as a friend, do you think you could help me out financially? I'm like, you always fall for this. What happens when you turn 85 and you're not straight in your thinking? You're gonna send all your money away to the internet people. You know, I catch on really, really fast and I'm like, what? I can see where it's going, you know? And with the triple crown, I could start seeing where it was going. I was like, I'm picking up on this. It's like that song from the Beach Boys, Hang On To Your Ego. And Triple Crown's just like that. They come on like they're peace, peaceful, but inside they're so uptight. And that's how this is. It's uptight, it's insidious in a way. It has an underlying false, falseness from the oak ac extract and who knows what other flavors. So is it, is Triple Crown good to drink? If you don't think about it, it's fine. But boy, if you start examining it and taste challenging it, you're gonna say, uh oh. There's a little bit questionable about it. And there's a lot more than a little bit questionable about it. The more deep, the deeper you go, the more flaws it will exibit. The, 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 the seven crown does not do that, all right? It's dull, it's bland, as advertised. 
But I've been sipping on this Seven Crown for going on two years, and it does not break down. What I mean is it does not evidence unusual qualities or inappropriate qualities. So you can go through the Seven Crown, go buy a 1.75 liter. You'll see. Drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it. It'll never start to bring out an underlying phoniness, you know what I mean? So uh, it's not like Hillary Clinton where it's going to evolve in its uh, ideology. Anytime a politician tells you their ideology has evolved, they're hoping that you're as dumb as you seem to be. All right. Their ideology has not evolved. Their ideology never changed. Their ideology was simply the quest for power, political power. You say, well, I don't get off on political power. You're not insane. You're not a psychopath. But some psychopaths get off on that. That That is their turn on. You know, you say, well, I saw this beautiful woman. I was excited. Yeah. They could take or leave that. That's accoutrements. That's They want political power. You say, that's like a mad person. They're evil. Correct. And they'll tell you anything, you know, and uh, but that's what they want. And th so when they say, well, my position has evolved. It hasn't evolved at all. They never had a position. And a person like her, Hillary, you say you're singling her out. She's just a perfect example. She's not the only example by any means. But you think about her, a person who has no boundaries. If if she thought the world was becoming right-wing nationalist, then she would be the greatest right-wing nationalist you ever saw. She'd make that guy in Germany look like he was moderate. All right. On the other hand, if she thought it was going to be the people's revolution, a Soviet world, she'd be running around with a hammer and sickle flag. This is the nature of the beast. This is the monster, a monster that you and, and you say, but there's a lot of politicians like that. I know many, many, most, maybe, maybe most, maybe most. I'm just using a prototype. You know, a prototype is the example on which you can measure everything, the baseline. So she would be the perfect example. So uh, anyway, the Seagram Seven Crown doesn't is is not a politician. It's not going to evolve. The flavor doesn't evolve. You don't go back 20 years later and say, "Well, my palate changed." I used to love it, but now I look down on it. I, that bothers me. But maybe people's palates do change, you see. Uh, mine, all, all the stuff I've been trying since 1996, it all tastes the same to me. You know what I mean? People say, well, what do you think about this product now that your palate has changed? I say, my palate did not change. I just got used to stuff. That's not my palate changing. I just like maybe I wasn't used to bitter things, and then, but it still tastes the same. Like it was just I wasn't um, adjusted to it. But it, but the, the the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale it tastes the same than when I first tried it. As when I first tried it. So the Secret Seven Crown, what I'm saying is that flavor will not evolve. It will be always the same. And to me, that's a sign of quality. It's not going to trick you. It isn't designed to trick you or entice you or to, to, you know, deceive you. So I, I admire it. I admire its simplicity. You say you're like ash. You admire it. I admire its purity. Okay. Thanks for watching this video production. And tomorrow it's Canadian whiskey time. Get ready for some Canadian whiskey taste challenges thanks for watching this video production now i'm going to walk look daytime and calm no wind no rain no wind no rain